The Crete a Piro was Haiti's strongest ship and her nation's flagship. When Admiral Kielik declared that he was taking sides in a brewing civil war, it was therefore not surprising that he took the powerful ship with him into the fight. The vessel had no match so long as it was compared to other Haitian vessels, but it would soon become embroiled in an international incident that would spell its explosive end. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the explosive end of the Crete a Pero? Here we are. Enjoy! The German ship, the Marco Magna, stopped as commanded by the Crete a Pero. Though whether or not the Crete a Pero was still the flagship of the Haitian Navy really depended on who was asked at that exact moment. Haiti was in the midst of a bitter fight over who the next president of the nation was going to be. The two frontrunners were Nord Alexis and Antonor Fermin with Nord Alexis having the favor of the military, and Antonor Fermin having the favor of the navy, or at least the navy's admiral. As it had become clear that things were going to turn to force, Admiral Killick had taken the flagship and declared himself to be on the side of Fermin. Now he shouted up to the Marcomania to know if they had weapons on board. He had received word that they would be carrying weapons bound for the Haitian government, and Furman's forces were running short on ammunition. Once the captain of the Marcomania admitted that the weapons were on board, against his protests, the ship was boarded by Admiral Killick and his men, who seized the weapons. They would claim it was their right. The German government would say it was an act of piracy against a neutral government. It was an action that would have ripples far further than anyone would know at the time. The entire matter started when the German government became angered by the actions of the government of Haiti. In what would later be known as the Luders Affair, a man named Emil Luders was arrested and imprisoned after allegedly striking a police officer in an altercation. Worse, he had been jailed previously for attacking a soldier, leading to a longer sentence of imprisonment on this occasion. This would not have been a particularly noteworthy incident still, a small brawl on the streets of Port-au-Prince, except that Luders was a German citizen who lived in Haiti. Count von Schweden, who was in charge of managing matters regarding Haiti's German population, quickly reached out to President Sam, who released Luders rather than face any diplomatic difficulties. Though Luders left immediately for Germany on his release, Count von Schweden was not happy still, and he requested support from Germany to respond to the mistreatment of a German national. Two German ships were soon in the bay of Port-au-Prince, and an ultimatum was delivered to President Sam. He was to give a large monetary compensation to looters, apologize to the German government, fire a salute to the German flag, and hold a reception in honor of Count von Schweden, or the ships would fire on the capital. President Sam surrendered to their demands in the face of a firepower far greater than his own. The Haitian population felt their nation had been humiliated, and they directed their anger about this embarrassment at President Sam, who resigned in the face of it. This resignation left a provisional government under the provisional president, Bozron Canal, until a new president could be elected. But the election of a new president soon saw the nation in civil war. The events to follow have no impartial chroniclers, which at times, makes it hard to find the truth. Fermin was clearly the most popular candidate from the start. A long-standing voice of political reform and racial equality, 
Furman had been popular enough with the common people that the previous administration had given him a post in France in the hopes that absence would weaken his political power. With a political election looming, Furman now returned to announce his candidacy for president. There were other candidates, but only one other who stood a good chance at the president, Nord Alexis. Nord Alexis had strong political ties through his family, and strong ties to the military after a lifetime of service. In the provisional government, Nord Alexi held the role of Minister of War, giving him the command of the nation's army, which he was accused of using to further his own political ambitions. The election was supposed to be June 28th, but it instead turned into a street battle, with Furman leaving Port-au-Prince for Gonaïve, where he declared the elections to be fraudulent. Things might have been handled quickly between the two candidates due to Nord Alexi's strong military presence, except for the actions of Admiral Killick. Seeing that this was turning from an election into a conflict, Admiral Killick announced that he was on the side of Furman, and he brought Haiti's flagship with him when he chose sides. The Crete et Perot could now be considered the most powerful tool that Furman had in holding his own against the forces loyal to Nord Alexis. Originally sent from England for the Haitian Navy in 1896, the Crete a Perot was 950 tons and was armed with one 6.2-inch gun, one 4.7-inch gun, four 3.9-inch guns, two Maxim guns, and four Nordenfeldt machine guns. There was no other ship in the Haitian Navy that could match her, and Furman and Admiral Killick did their best to use this to their advantage though they were losing ground on land. Initially, Admiral Killick took his gunboat to attempt a blockade of Cape Haitian, but his instructions from Furman meant that it was not a strict maritime blockade of the entire port. Instead, he was instructed to only stop shipments of weapons and ammunition from entering the port, and to ignore all other merchant vessels. Admiral Killick would later admit that this was not a particularly successful blockade. By July 26th, the provisional government of Haiti declared that Furman was an outlaw. If they thought this would ease matters, they were mistaken, and the few bastions of strength Furman's forces still controlled instead proclaimed that Furman was their president. Matters were escalating, and Furman sent orders for Admiral Killick to also set up his blockade. On August 29th, Furman had met with the commander of the American ship, the Machias, and was reassured that the United States intended to maintain neutrality, though the United States in their own documents had already called into question the rights of Admiral Killick to stop and search their vessels for weapons. The neutrality of the United States heartened Furman, however, and he ordered a bold move. He knew that the German ship, the Marcomania, would soon be headed towards Cape Haitian, with 25 boxes of rifles, 25 boxes of cartridges, and 15 kegs of powder, all bound for the provisional government. Since these were the forces opposed to Furman, he ordered that Admiral Killick should stop the German steamer, board her, and seize all the weapons. Though the Marcomania stopped when the Crete a Perot hailed her on September 2nd, the captain was more reluctant to surrender the weapons that were part of her cargo. Following the orders of Furman against this eventuality, Admiral Killick fired a shot across her bows, though he took care not to actually hit the German ship. With this show of force, the German captain allowed his ship to be boarded and even showed them where the weapons were stored. As they were loading the seized goods onto the Crete et Perot, the Marcomania's longboat arrived, and in it, an officer from the nearby American Navy vessel, the Cincinnati. The officer told them to stand by in the name of his captain until the Cincinnati could come closer, but Admiral Killick refused, saying that his business was all done, 
and they could find him in Port Margot. He presented the captain of the Marcomania a certificate stating that he had examined the ship, seized goods as contraband of war since they were shipped in Port-au-Prince by General Boisra Canal, and that he had then allowed the Marcomania to continue her voyage. He was concerned that the Cincinnati might take him at his word and come to find him in Port Margot. Considering how much weaker their force was to the American vessel, he said that if the Americans tried to use force, he would blow up the Crete et Perot after disembarking the crew. The Cincinnati did not come to find them, but that did not diminish the international implications of the action. The English officers that served under Admiral Killick would later say that they had warned him that his blockade was too poorly enforced and too inconsistent to justify the boarding of a German vessel and seizing goods. But Admiral Killick was determined to follow orders. Though America maintained its firm position that they were neutral, the American government was also a little more open to the idea that since Haiti was in the middle of a civil war, and the Marcomania had been boarded in Haitian waters. It was a fair act of war, since the Marcomania's cargo had been shipped by one side and seized by the other. Germany took a much harsher view and considered it open seas piracy against a merchant vessel of their nation. As soon as Nord Alexis told the Germans what had happened, a German battleship, the Panther, was dispatched to Gonaïve, where the Crete et Perot was now at harbor. After three months at sea, its boilers needed to be cared for, and Admiral Killick needed to have surgery on his finger. Admiral Killick was still on shore at home, on September 6th, when the Panther sailed into the harbor of Gonaïve and made herself known by firing a gun near the Crete à Perot. Quickly, Admiral Killick returned to his ship and sent his secretary to find out the German ship's intention. The secretary quickly returned, saying that the German captain had refused lengthy conversation but gave them five minutes to surrender the ship under the orders of Kaiser Wilhelm II. With this time, Admiral Killick ordered that his men leave the ship, which all but his physician did. Dr. Colt chose to remain at the Admiral's side until the end. Admiral Killick arranged a fuse to the ship's magazine and lowered the Haitian flag from its standard. This, the Panther might have thought, was a sign of surrender. But instead of surrendering, Admiral Killick wrapped himself in the flag, lit a cigar, and put it to the fuse. The Crete à Perot exploded quickly and in a mass of flames, forcing the Panther to reverse their engines to a safer distance before they began to fire on the burning ship in order to sink it. At least one newspaper in Singapore would express contempt that Admiral Killick would take such a path when his ship was better armed than the Panther was, and that he ought to have fought. His men would later describe the Admiral as conflicted when first faced with the German ship. His men wanted to fight, and the Crete à Perot was initially cleared for battle. But he was worried that if he did sink the Panther, or win the battle, it would only call down a larger German force on Haiti, and cause division to his country. He was equally unwilling to surrender, however, and abandon a cause he believed in. He followed through with the action he had suggested to Furman, only a few days before, if the Cincinnati came to find him. This episode rose strong anti-German feelings in Gonaïve, and when the captain of the Panther went on shore to visit with the German consul and received the news of a telegram from Kaiser Wilhelm II commending them on redressing the insult to the German flag, the Panther was forced to remain with her guns pointed towards the shore to ensure his safe return. His reception on shore by the population was strong enough that he did not stay long, and the Panther also left for Cape Haitian shortly after. She was supposed to return to Gonaïve later, but Powell, the American minister to Haiti, wrote to America asking to intercede, and asked Germany to not have her return to Gonaïve for some time out of fear 
that the anti-German sentiment in Gonaiv might turn into anti-foreigner sentiment more generally, if given only a little more provocation. In Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm II wrote in the margins of the report on the incident, Bravo, Panther. A charred body was found floating in the harbor the next day and it was assumed to be that of Admiral Killick. It was given a burial, and the admiral would be considered a hero and a martyr by Furman's forces. That was not enough to bring Furman victory, though. With his greatest weapon no more, Furman sailed for the Bahamas a month later, and finally settled in St. Thomas, where he died in 1911, an exile. In December of the same year, a nation tired of fighting declared Nord Alexis the new president. As for the English officers who had served on the Crete et Perot, they were sent back to their own nation, with fares paid for by Furman, since they no longer had a ship to serve on. Nord Alexis remained president until 1909, when a revolution led by Antoine Simon marched on Port-au-Prince, forcing Nord Alexis to flee for Jamaica. What would follow would be the epoch of ephemeral presidents, and more revolutions would follow. What remained longer than any of the leaders involved in the fight over the presidency was the lingering image of Admiral Killick's sacrificial action. Over the years, it would come to be seen as a symbol of patriotism in Haiti, and Admiral Killick would be honored with a stamp in 1943 showing the explosion of the ship and the portrait of the admiral in a wreath. So the Furbanist War is remembered best by how it was brought to an end, by the act of a man who firmly believed in the cause he was fighting for, even if it was the losing one. For more information, please see Papers Relating to the Foreign Relations of the United States with the annual message of the President transmitted to Congress December 2, 1902, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.